Hello, everyone. I am Bob Lingle of Off the Bean Path Bookstore in Lakewood, New York. Our guest is one of the most widely recognized political cartoonists of his generation. He is syndicated by the Washington Post and is the recipient of the Herblock Prize and the Thomas Nass Prize. He served in the U.S. Army from 1967 to 1971, served one year in Vietnam in the 1st Air Cavalry and the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, as well as other units. He received the Bronze Star and the Air Medal. He is the author of Lieutenant Dangerous, and he is Jeff Danzinger. Thanks for joining us tonight, Jeff. Glad to be here. Um, and I also want to thank um, everyone watching and also Anthony Sasso of Steerforth Press for helping get this event set up. Um, we've had a couple events with Steerforth, and they have quickly become my favorite publisher. So excellent choice getting published by them. <laughs> um, so... More than 45 years have passed since the Vietnam War, and at least for me, and I feel like the country, it, it still looms over America um, from the people who fought in it to the children, um, me being one of them, of, of those veterans. Uh, why did you feel at this time that you needed to, to tell your, your story? Well, I, I think many Vietnam vets uh, are a little bit troubled by the fact that the war seems to be forgotten, and uh, we don't we don't see that it's being taught in in high schools and in college classes very much. It's actually, if anything, it's being taught uh, by Hollywood films and by by, by television. Uh, the so that that feeling that we should try to make. A, uh, make some kind of effort to, to make sure that, that it is being uh, not only recognized, but remembered and talked about and, and told. It was a terrible time. It was a terrible time in the nation's history. It was very bad for a certain people. 55 American uh, who served over there were killed, 58, excuse me, and um, probably equal or more were grievously wounded. So I thought, well, I'll try to write what I remember. I had written a, a novel before, and it, it was uh, it was okay, and it was satisfying to do, but I was trying to write some a sort of a catch-22 novel about Vietnam. And so it didn't, it wasn't really me talking. Uh, so that's, that's a part of it. And I, I've talked to other certainly other Vietnam authors and other vets. And we agree that uh, you just, you don't see it taught in the schools, you don't see it taught in the universities. I began uh, thinking about writing this when I was talking to a group of uh, young uh, college students, young by my standards. Mm -hmm. And they, one guy asked me, he said, well, if you didn't like the uh, the army, you didn't like the war. Why did you join? And I tried to explain to him, I didn't join. I was drafted, and when you were drafted, you sort of didn't have any choice, and that the draft itself was terribly unfair and and prejudiced, and I guess I, you could almost say by today's standards, it was racist. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were in college, you were deferred from the draft, which meant that people who had the money and the, and the, and the background and so on to go to college didn't have to serve. Uh, if you were married for a long time, you didn't have to serve. If you had a child after that, you didn't have to go. If you had a job in certain industries, uh, they would draft you. If you were sick or wounded or had, had, in some other way or had a, a physical affliction, they wouldn't draft you. If you, as a good friend of mine, had a football, a football injury, and he wasn't drafted. And all of that, and if you were homosexual, you would not be drafted. I didn't have any of those, and so mm -hmm. I was drafted. In addition, these, and so, so the people I was 
talking to these young people, a couple of graduates from good schools, and they said, well, we didn't know any of this. We never, it's never been brought out. We've seen a couple of movies and formed our opinion on that. Uh, the movies were a kind of a second, second insult because, in fact, most of the movies, whether it's The Deer Hunter or Hamburger Hill or Apocalypse Now, show the experience in Vietnam as something that drove people crazy. Mm. So that when uh, veterans came back from the war zone, they had really had trouble getting jobs because everybody thought that they were uh, baby killers and, and lunatics and unstable. So that was uh, an additional problem that they faced. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I, I'm just mentally checking off the questions that you're already addressing. <laughs> yeah, well, um, well, I wanted to get into the, the difference um, of experience. One of the reasons that I... Um, I was attracted to, to your book, um, having looked at a lot of the Steerforth Press titles. I saw Lieutenant Dangerous, a Vietnam War memoir. Um, my dad was a Vietnam veteran. Um, he passed away five years ago. After he passed away, my siblings and I just read anything that we could get our hands on that had something to do with Vietnam. Um, Joe Klein's Payback, I feel like, was one that like really gave us a sense of what my dad had gone through as, as a Marine over there and like the, the trauma of um, like just the, the craziness of everything going on. What I liked about yours is a contrast to that is it's very um, just plainly detailed of these are all of the reasons that this war wasn't working and why it couldn't work. Um, and I, I want to get into some of the specifics of that. Um, but my dad, being um, a man who wasn't known for making the best decisions, um, he wanted to enlist in the Navy while Vietnam was going on. The Navy did not want him. So out of anger, he joined, joined the Marines. You were drafted. And what I found interesting with your story is just growing up without a draft, I ha like I'm registered for the draft, um, there was always a fear. I was in high school when 9-11 happened and you just thought like, oh, well, I wonder if they're going to bring back the draft then and as, as the war still continue on. It's just something that you think about. Um, but just in the things that I've always seen, it was the Earth Day, Earth Day lottery. But your experience was before the birthday lottery where it was draft boards. Can you elaborate on how that was um, set up uh, when you were drafted in? The, the draft was very unfair for a number of reasons, the ones I already said about what mm -hmm. got deferred out of it. But also that if you, you were drafted by a local draft board, a group of citizens that was appointed uh, by the uh, Defense Department, and they were told that they had to supply so many names every month. Wherever you were when you were 18, that was your draft board, and you couldn't change it. I had a friend uh, who went to Dartmouth College, and he turned 18. He was from Montana, and he went to Dartmouth College. And when he turned 18, he registered. And when he graduated, the draft board in, in New Hampshire, where, where Dartmouth is, immediately drafted him even though he had already taken off to go back to Montana to his, to his family. Mm -hmm. And they did so in, so they wouldn't have to draft somebody from their own community, uh, the sons of families that they knew. So that was, that really kind of stunk. And mm -hmm. we thought it did. It also meant that if you lived in a town where they had a university and they could supply the, the draft with uh, students, you, 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 you wouldn't get drafted. I had a draft board in Peeksville, New York. And when I moved to Vermont, you had to tell them where you had gone. Uh, they, they drafted me. And once you were drafted, what was the, the time obligation that you had to serve? 
for the army? If you were drafted, it was two years. Okay. And once you were in, it was a pretty straight shot to the infantry. And I, knowing even less about myself than I do now, I knew I didn't want to be in the infantry. Something mm -hmm. just uh, told me. You could sign up for additional schools within the Army. It cost you more time. But as I write, at least it wasn't uh, the infantry. Infantry is a very, very hard duty, especially in, a, in, in jungle warfare. It's just, it's just the worst kind. So I signed up for this language school, and the Army has a curious way of letting you think you're going to get what you want and then not giving it to you. So I signed up for the language school largely because it was a, a year long, 47 weeks, uh, six hours a day, two hours of language lab at night. And they said, well, what language would you like to learn? I said, would you like to learn Russian or German or French? I said, yeah, Russian would be interesting. And they said, good, uh, Vietnamese. <laughs> so I wound, up, <laughs> I wound up at the language school. It was a, El Paso, Texas, at Fort Bliss for a year, um, learning this strange, difficult to learn Asian language. I don't think I was ever terribly good at it, but I was, I was good enough. And the goal for you and for a lot of the people that were drafted was to, to run out the clock on, on that. That's right. That's right. And we almost did halfway through the class. Uh, through the 47-week course, Lyndon Johnson announced that he wasn't going to run for president again and that he would uh, start the Paris peace talks. So we thought, well, it'll only be a few weeks. Everybody will agree to peace. Well, that wasn't the case. It was five more years. Yeah. There was an aspect of it. Um, I want to read a, a quote from the book of, in no other organization than the army is it necessary to be able to sound like you know what you're talking about and you had found your skill set in lathering i connected with that of um i was in the wrong program in college my freshman year but during that program i learned the art of bsing and i'm like wow. oh lathering and bsing same same <laughs> side of the coin and very useful skills um and a part of that um you said the dominant feeling of Vietnam was confusion. Can you talk about some of the dynamics of the war um, in relation to North Vietnam and China um, and what their intentions were with, with communism in South Vietnam and how they felt about democracy? I, I don't, I, I say in there that the, an army has basically two jobs, mm -hmm. kill people and blow things up. And what they wanted the army to do in Vietnam was to, assist or advise the South Vietnamese army in keeping the, uh, the revolt, the communist uh, revolutionaries down and sending them back to the, the northern part of Vietnam. I didn't know, not only did I not know where Vietnam was, I didn't know what it was, but it's a country whose northern border is China. And if anybody thought that the Chinese, still being run by Mao Zedong, was going to allow the Americans to come into the country on their border and win a war. They were dreaming. It wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. In addition, the Chinese, uh, they armed the North Vietnamese. They supplied them with everything, including money. And they uh, would have gone on forever. They would have supplied them with soldiers. We should have thought about this because the other country that bordered China was North Korea. And I guess our government thought sooner or later, the worst thing that could happen was a kind of a North Korea, South Korea thing where we would establish the line and life would go on. But that, that was not going to happen. Too many, it, it was just, we couldn't expect soldiers to go in after all the bombing that we had done and make a make a peaceful settlement or or as Lyndon Johnson used to say, win hearts and minds. 
somebody pointed out that win hearts and minds as an acronym is wham. Mm -hmm. well, it didn't it didn't work and it was much too confusing. And I just want to take a note um, to say, address two things. One, I already warned Jeff about, we have a very bad storm going on right now. If we are suddenly gone, it means we lost power and I apologize. <laughs> Hopefully the power keeps rolling through, but the storm seems to be getting worse. Um, also for anyone watching on Facebook, Instagram, not Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, if you have any questions um, throughout the event, you can use the comment feature and we'll see those on our end. Um, there is an element, the, our first um, ever virtual event that we did last year was with Eric Edstrom, who wrote Un-American. Um, and there, he was a West Point graduate, um, served in Afghanistan, and kind of walked out of that war with some of the same feelings that, that you went into, you went in and left Vietnam with. Um, they, and part of it was kind of like the indoctrination that especially men, when they're growing up in America, go through of you'd been raised to think that the United States was generally on the side of good, um, that wars were a necessary part of that. Um, and I, um, there's one more quote that I, that I wanted to read of, um, it is said that Americans are shallow thinkers trained by advertising and the consumer economy to judge problems quickly in whatever way requires the least reading or analysis. And you had also talked about um, the role of television. Um, and I kind of saw how that all coalesced together. Um, what was the role of television in advertising that you saw um, during that time period? Television, this was the first, uh, it is sometimes called the uh, living room war because the films, and they were still films, not there was no video, uh, were rushed uh, from Vietnam to Hong Kong and rushed back uh, so that people could see the fighting on their television screens at night. That probably uh, the uh, generals in charge said that's why no one wanted to sign up for it. It looks, it looks bad. Um, in full color, people slogging through rice paddies with rifles uh, shooting at each other. Uh, but but the, I think you're, you're right to ask the question, what, what was it that we were supposed to do? The Army was confused at a certain point. Uh, we had no idea how long it was going on. Lyndon Johnson used to talk about the fact that he could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, maybe he could see it, but nobody else could see it. And the joke was always made, yes, it's an oncoming train. Mm -hmm. That's the light that he sees. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there, in relation to the um, Eric Edstrom's um, talk that we had with him, there's also, um, you had talked about it, it um, the, that West Point, graduates, the people in West Point learn history better than than most people. Um, yeah. Eric is a West Point graduate. There's another Steerforth press title that just came out recently, The True History of the United States. Um, the author is a former um, teacher at West Point, former officer and instructor at West Point who taught U.S. history. Um, and then they're just in local, um, or not local, recent news, um, I can't recall the general's name, but yes, General Miller. Yeah, spoke to Congress and gave a dressing down to to Matt Gates. And, and they and well, Matt Gates was one of them, but the other guy actually had been a vet. The other, yeah, I, I can't remember his name right now. Mm -hmm. But it was the same thing of not knowing what the deal is. What are we supposed to be doing? Why are we doing it? And I think they want uh, officers coming out of West Point to know the history of, of everything that has anything to do with what their their uh, their mission is. I mean, for example, knowing what communism is. Uh, we were fighting communism. Well, it turns out that Vietnamese weren't communists. They were and are very good little capitalists. You can buy almost anything now. Tires made in Vietnam, uh, clothing and so on. And 
even even more amazing, the Chinese have turned out to be wonderful capitalists. The Communist Party is still sort of in charge, but that's because they somebody has to be in charge. Mm -hmm. but as far as following uh, precepts of communism, whatever it is, they don't. My, my father once said that the cure for communism was communism. If you want communism, go ahead, see how it works out for you. And in a couple generations, you'll decide that it's not going to work. Why, um, with the experience that they have and the, the education that they have, do you feel that with knowing U.S. history, that they kind of continue to repeat the same mistakes? Um, it's more just your op opinion on, on it. I don't know. I really don't know, and I, and I wish I did know. The simple answer is, there's money in it. If you could get the money out of, out, of, out of war, you would probably stop war immediately. You know, this is an amazing fact that one of the large contractors in Vietnam was a company called RMK. And it was partially owned by Lady Bird Johnson, who was... Just a minute, homie. That's okay. <laughs> well, I'll call you back. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have turned that off. Well, I had a call come in right during the intro video, so uh, I'm yeah. sure even. <laughs> anyway. Um, it's a so, company that Lady Bird Johnson owned. Yeah, well, she owned part of that, and other parts of it were owned by other other congressmen. And, uh, you know, it's very hard for people to to change their minds when they're making a great deal of money on it. The, uh, I mentioned in the, the book why West Point, I'm sure, wants their officers to know how everything works and how we got to where we are. In South Vietnam and in parts of North Vietnam too, the leading crop was rubber. The uh, Michelin Tire Company had been there since before when Vietnam was a French colony. And the French were not good colonists. The tire plantations, these big tall trees, went on for miles, literally miles and miles of, of these trees. And the South Vietnamese government with our government, with our ambassadors over there, came to an agreement that the United States Army could not shoot artillery into the rubber plantations because it damages the trees, which meant that we were providing a hiding place. Artillery, American artillery is pretty accurate and plentiful. And so when the uh, when the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong were wounded or needed to hide someplace, they hid in the rubber plantations. The only way to get them out of the rubber plantations was to go in on foot. This was the 11th uh, Armored Cavalry, the ACR, and fight with them tree to tree. It was very dangerous fighting. Wow. It, was, it was awful. It was awful. I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't like it. But the agreement had been made with our ambassador there, Mr. Ellsworth Bunker, and the uh, American government and the South Vietnamese government. It should never have been made. And on the topic of kind of the commercial commercialization of, of war, there is a, a good section of the book where you were listing of all the companies that were just kind of brands um, that were making money through. But the one that I was most blown away with was when you first went into Saigon and there was the billboard from Chase Manhattan Bank yeah. welcoming you. And so and I guess the, well, their slogan at the time was, you have a friend at the Chase Manhattan Bank. <laughs> and I knew that it was basically David Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. He was the, the boss of the Chase Bank. 
but it, it just seems like something out of satire that there would be billboards up and more um, very literally sponsor <laughs> sponsoring um, the involvement that you're in um, something oh there is part of the the repeating history and it was a kind of a theme of a couple of things that that I had read Malcolm Gladwell's newest book um, is the bomber mafia it goes into how strategic bombing started its early days in World War II and then progressed into Vietnam War, into the Vietnam War. Um, it, I don't really have a question about this. It was, I just wanted to address, address yeah, no. the, the repeated history of trying to bomb away a, a problem um, and how ineffective. Well, we, and, the, and the statistic, we dropped more bombs in North Vietnam, total tonnage of bombs, then were dropped by all sides in World War II. Mm -hmm. And the thing that struck me as I began to realize what was going on was that first of all, you drop a bomb, it blows up in about a couple hundred yard radius, everything is knocked down, people are killed, but beyond that, you're more or less safe. And you can hide in bomb craters that have been made by previous bombs. So it was just about as ineffectual as it could be. Plus, the mountains in North Vietnam and, and, and Vietnam and in Cambodia are rugged hills. You can, well, they're mountains. You can drop all the bombs you want, but it, it's not going to make a great deal of difference. People who want to come back down, down this uh, trail from the north, bringing down ammunition and food and everything else, they're going to be able to do it without, uh, without uh, the bombs are not going to stop. Them. Well, what I've, for pretty much the entire war on terror, I've always equated these mass bombings to punching a bully in the face yeah. and so they start to like you. Yeah, yeah. It's not really, yeah. the, <laughs> not yeah, really the best no. method. Um, and then what, well, uh, it, yes, right. And what uh, communism there needed, because it doesn't work as a, an economic system, but they needed an enemy. Mm -hmm. And so we, we gave them. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that General Milley made the point that West Point and probably the other, the other service academies, uh, Probably not the Air Force because they uh, they want their people to read uh, novels about wars and novels about history and everything else. And uh, uh, Matt Gates came up with the idea that well, they were emasculating the, the troops and, and the officers. And uh, what Milley said, no, they're not. Wrong, but he was. What um, I liked the part of the your book where you had a chance to talk to Neil Sheehan, um, and you had had the opportunity to ask him like what what what's the lesson of Vietnam, and he basically said they'll never be able to do that again. Um, you disagreed with that. Um, why did you disagree? And what what do you feel is the, the biggest lesson, even what's the biggest lesson for you for from Vietnam? Well, I'd say that Neil Sheehan was a New York Times reporter during the war. And when he came back, he sat down and wrote this book called A White Shining Lie. It's the most masterful book. Of, it's a masterful book, no matter what the subject is, but about Vietnam, it's, it's, it's uneven. And he came through on his book tour in, I think, about 80 five or six, and I was detailed to interview him in Boston. And he said that, I said, what, what does the war mean? And he said, well, uh, they'll never be able to do that again, meaning that we'll never be able to mount a, a, a military into a, into a foreign country and so on. And I, I said, I, you're a smarter man than I am, Mr. Sheehan, but I think you're wrong. And unfortunately, very unfortunately, it's turned out that I was right they, meaning I 
guess the politicians or the president or the Pentagon that have been able to do it, and they have done it. I think and, uh, um, he must have been rather saddened to find out that nobody paid any attention to what he had to say. The habit of repeating history, as I we yes. continue to as I continue to repeat. Um, so what? What was your personal biggest takeaway from from Vietnam? What what lessons did did you learn? Was there anything positive or beneficial that <laughs> that you can say? Uh, I returned a far more serious and uh, doubtful person. I began teaching school in, in Vermont, and I think I was a better teacher because of that. I had got a little more respect from the students because I was a vet. And I also did not feel sorry for them. I felt that compared to the children that I had seen in villages in Vietnam, uh, American kids, especially in living in a, a nice place like rural Vermont, really didn't have anything to complain about. So that, I think in a way that made me into a better teacher. Yeah. Um, there was the, and I want to just put another note out if anyone's watching um, that has any questions, you can use the comment feature and we will take those. Um, but there is kind of the last chunk of the book of um, where you keep asking the question, what did I do? Um, as if someone was asking you, what what did you do towards the end of Vietnam? What, what decisions were you making? Um, you turn it around and say, what would you do? I was debating on asking this question because it's I always find the time traveling back in time question silly because Do Dr. Emmett Brown has not invented the time machine yet. Um, but if you could go back in time, knowing what you know, would you go to Canada or Sweden or would you stay? <laughs> uh, I think I was, uh, I think I was raised to be very obedient mm -hmm. and it worked for me. And in the fifties, that, that's what people did. They did largely what they were told. The nation was shocked by the fact that people refused, young people refused to do it. Families came apart at the seams. Uh, intergenerational warfare went on for, for quite a while. I asked that because at the end of my uh, discussion with these people I was talking to, I asked them, I said, well, if the government told you that you had to go to uh, Iraq or Iran or someplace over there or Lebanon or who knows where and get trained to be a soldier, what would you do? Would you would you would you obey the order? And I think most of them said no they wouldn't. So now I've been writing about this, but the army now tries to talk people into enlisting. And the problem for the army was that if someone gets in and then decides that they don't like it, they can just leave. They can just say, well, I, 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 I was wrong in my enlistment. I've changed my mind. Goodbye. The draftees couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. They still had such things in effect as desertion. If you didn't show up for your port call or you didn't, or you disobeyed an order, you wound up being court martialed. I was when I when I when I was there, and I after a year studying Vietnamese, when I finally got to Vietnam, I was put in a mechanical maintenance forward support battalion, about which I knew nothing, but I, they assumed, it. and I finally had to get a letter from my. Senator George Aiken back in, the, in Vermont to get out of this because it was, first of all, it was very dangerous. We had to fly up to fire bases, change the uh, gun tubes. And by the Army, by pointing this out that I was in a job where I didn't know what I was doing, the Army, at least the command and the first cavalry, got very angry at me. They were going to threaten court martial. There, just to um, reiterate your your point for people watching, um, 
you were assigned to be an ordinance officer and your first task, your first personal task was looking up what the word ordinance was. Yes. <laughs> Which uh, is not a ideal for somebody <laughs> yeah. tasked with leading them. Um, normally when I set up these interviews, I always try to put together a linear path of where the line of questioning will go. Um, and then I wanted to address some of the aspects of how much of a mess Vietnam was for you personally. And then I realized that is the entire book. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out a way to, to boil it down. But um, there was just like some aspects, um, just from what everything that I've read about Vietnam before, that still surprised me. Um, can you kind of talk about the experience of the South Vietnamese families? that were just around around your base and how that, that came to be? Yeah, I, for a while I was assigned or I wound up with the ARVM, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, which was the South Vietnamese Army. And they, they had uh, the ability to bring their families along with them. So they would be at a base and the, the family would come along and they would start to build little houses for themselves right outside the outside the base. The, the really curious thing about it, I put this in the book, was that we, the American beer companies, have switched over to aluminum cans, but they already had a huge amount of steel, steel beer cans already printed with the labels on it, Budweiser and Schaefer and so on. And so they somehow shifted this free printed beer label can steel over to Vietnam. And these people were building houses and that said, you know, Schaefer, Schaefer, Schaefer all over the side of the house. It was almost too funny, but I mean, it wasn't. Funny. Yeah. Um, we have actually, normally when I talk to an author, they, uh, yeah are very chatty. You yeah. are perfectly <laughs> concise with, with your answers, but I was an anticipating more, um, but I don't want to uh, just drag it out for the sake of dragging it out to hit the hour mark. But is there anything that you would like to add? Um, I really appreciate the, the time that you um, took with us. And um, I loved loved reading the book um, and we have, have them in stock at the store for customers. Well, the, the desire on the part of vets, I, I, I think, at least on me and my part, is that there are lessons to be learned from what happened in Vietnam. There are lessons to be learned from what happened in Korea and World War II and so on. We usually wind up um, um, learning the wrong lesson. I and mean, we have to be careful that that doesn't happen again. It appears, and this is timing this right now is that we are pulling out of Afghanistan. Uh, everybody who's ever gone into Afghanistan to make a change has, after a while, whether it was the British or the Russians who uh, pulled out entirely, or, or in this case, uh, or NATO or us. And we should have learned, you know, just don't do it. Because the lesson in, in Afghanistan, and as it was in Vietnam, is that they don't want to be any particular ism. They just want to have a country. And they've had a country for a long time. The Vietnamese wanted to be Vietnamese. They didn't necessarily. Uh, but the colonization threw them into this cycle where somebody could come along and say, we have to have a rebellion and we have to throw out the French or whatever. Americans, and the next thing you know, everybody's got guns and is uh, shooting at each other. Do you have any sense of optimism that we will eventually learn? I mean, I, Americans, especially young Americans, need more education. They need more travel. I and mean, this is a n number I heard that in the United States, 18% of the people have passports. It's not very many. And when you go overseas and you start to travel around, you, you really you learn a great deal. But 
we don't seem to learn that. The schools aren't very good. We don't seem to value education. Uh, our universities are okay, some of them. Uh, but we've simply got to learn more. Uh, and I lived for a time in Europe, and everybody had a passport. If you wanted to travel, you could, you could just go. It's, it's what we've got to do. We've got to get, in a word, we have to get smarter. And that means the average, uh, the average Vermont, the average uh, American has just got to get smarter, read more, understand more, not be involved in uh, religious, religious explanations for why things happen the way they do. Vote for smarter people, not accept a lot of baloney from them. Politicians. The one of the hardest challenges, um, just from my opinion, is the money aspect. If people are getting rich off of a thing, it would, becomes very difficult to stop that thing from happening. So, yeah. it's almost impossible because the, mm -hmm. the Congress, uh, people in the Congress and the Senate got to have money to to get elected and so they are ready to do whatever is necessary and they don't think about it most of the people unfortunately i'm not just talking about dick cheney who who uh, got i think five deferments and then wanted to go and start wars all over the place matt gates never served uh, joe biden never served George uh, H. George W. Bush served a little bit. Mm -hmm. The last president that we had that served was uh, George H. W. Bush, who, by the way, I voted for. I thought he was. I thought he had some intelligence as a America's position in the world. Bill Clinton, Mitt Romney, did. Mitt Romney got a deferment based on the uh, based on his religious uh, activities. He was out trying to talk the French into becoming Mormons. Good luck with that. Um, there was an aspect in your book where you had referenced searching for salvation. Um, it didn't come for you at that point. Was it something that you ever sought after once you came home? Well, that's why I I wonder about these movies and, and these books that talk about vets as uh, drug addled in, 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 in Vietnam. And there might have been some there, and obviously uh, some drugs were readily available. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, if you wanted to stay alive, you had to, you had to know what was going on, and you had to be sharp and aware, and you couldn't, you couldn't stumble around uh, under the influence of, of anything, you had to be you had to be sharp. And I, I that's why I did. And I, I'm not a, a drug person anyway. But, uh, and, and it was it was true all the way through the army. It's, it's a, my father's advice was: don't drink and don't eat the food if you can help it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was in the South Pacific in island fighting in World War Two. Came back alive. It's always the goal. Well, yes. um, well, thank you again so much for your time. Um, oh, let me see. Oh, uh, Phyllis just wanted to make a note of um, so many from their, from her age um, came back so dis so disillusioned. Um, thank you for being so honest. Well, I'll say this: I have a I have a friend who enlisted and lost a leg in Baghdad by stepping on a mine. And we've talked about this quite some time. He was, he enlisted as a volunteer, I was drafted. The difference between our experiences was that he had, a, he was from Minnesota, he had a very patriotic attitude toward the thing. It was his, it was his obligation to go and be a soldier. I, when I was drafted, thought it was lousy from the first day. I didn't want to be there. I hated the army. I hated the government. 
And I wasn't disappointed. What I thought was going to happen, happened. In his case, he was, after a while, very, he was disillusioned. I don't think I was. Well, if there's um, no other questions, um, I um, want to greatly encourage you to pick up. Went, let me, I, oh, I forgot yeah. this. Oh, yeah. what the title is. I was not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, I was not dangerous. My, mm. my, when I was over there as an interpreter in different units, I had some Arvin interpreters with me. They had studied English, and they couldn't uh, get their mouths around my last name, Danziger. And it came out, Danziger, da, da, da. <laughs> and so they finally decided on danger, Dangerous. And they thought that was very funny. So that's why I went through most of that known as Lieutenant Dangerous. <laughs> so the title is ironic. Don't yeah. be deceived. Jeff, right. he may be dangerous, but does not come off this <laughs> that way in this book. Um, it's a very honest um, telling of the story. Um, we just kind of scratched the surface of some of the struggles and the um, absurdities that you encountered. Um, we could... I like I'm hesitating to to ask more because so much of it is just in the book and we could probably talk for hours of all of the reasons that the Vietnam War um, right. turned out the way it did and, and operated the way, the way that it did. Um, so pick it up. Um, it's a great book. It's available in store as well as online. Um, I do want to plug a few um, future things that we have coming out going on in the store. Um, Lisa Marie Redmond will be in the store on Saturday for a book signing. She's the author of a cold case detective series. She is a retired cold case detective out of Buffalo. Um, there's a few virtual events that we have coming up next Thursday. We're going to be talking with Dax Devlin Ross. It's letters to my white male friends. This book was inspired out of the um, George Floyd killing. Um, and it's a conversation, it's a memoir, um, and it just kind of, it, it's a call to action to really think about um, for white males, for, for white people in, in general, but he kind of directed it more towards white males. Um, it's going to be a great conversation. He was recently featured on, on NPR um, last week and the week before. He was interviewed by Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook, and I get to talk to him next week. So that'll be it'll be an interesting conversation. There's two events in August. Um, Proof of Life is um, the camera's always backwards. Um, Daniel Levin is he is dangerous. Um, he is the um, military veteran. He works for a nonprofit in the Middle East, um, trying to do something positive over there. He knows several languages because of his background. He frequently, somewhat frequently, I would say anytime where it happens more than once to get involved in a hostage situation in the Middle East would be frequent. Um, this book talks about the 20 days that he is searching for a French citizen that was lost, has been missing in Syria for three months. Um, he meets with dangerous people. Um, we were fortunate to find a time where he is not overseas to to have a conversation with him and then continuing our trend of, of overseas books um, maps or lines we draw is allison kofelt's uh, memoir about her experience doing uh, mission work in haiti um, daniel levin's event is august 19th and allison's event is august 25th um, all of our events are are free um, and encourage everyone to, to tune into those um, Thank you again, Jeff. Were there any other last minute thoughts that, that you have on your mind that you would well, like to share? Thank, thank everybody for watching. Thanks again so much. Um, and I'm gonna play us out with um, the trailer for um, Dax, Devin, Dax Devlin Ross's event for next Thursday. Thanks again for watching and, and thank you, Jeff.
Thank you.